Hello, and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore ampersand books. I'll put the links in the chat. We're so excited to have Cheryl Boyce Taylor with us this evening. First, we'll hear her read, then she'll be in conversation with Allison Myers. Allison Myers is the executive director of Writers and Books and a veteran nonprofit leader with, of previous appointments at Cave Canem Foundation, Hillstead Museum in Connecticut, and the Oberlin Consumers Co-op. Allison is also a Pushcart Prize nominated poet, fiction writer, and essayist whose work may be found in various journals and anthologies. Cheryl Boyce Taylor is a poet and workshop facilitator. The recipient of the 2015 Barnes and Noble Writers for Writers Award, she is the founder and curator of the Calypso Muse and the Glitter Pomegranate Performance Series. She is the author of four collections of poetry, Raw Air, Night When Moon Follows, Convincing the Body, and Arrival. She has facilitated poetry workshops for Cave Canem, Poets and Writers, and the Caribbean Literary and Cultural Center. A Vona Fellow, her work has been widely published in journals. In Mama Fife Represents, she pays tribute to her departed son, Malik Fife Dog Taylor, of the legendary hip hop trio, A Tribe Called Quest. Told through a tapestry of narrative poems, dreams, anecdotes, journal entries, and letters, these fragments show a great love between mother and son. Both elegy and praise song, this is a narrative encompassing joy, sorrow, healing, and a mother's triumphant heart. Cheryl, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to you then. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really so thrilled to be reading with you and for you tonight and answering questions on Mama Five Represents. And the name of the book comes from my son's group, Tribe Called Quest. They had this very popular song called Tribe Called Quest Represents Represents. And his friends all called me Mama Five. So when it came time to find the name for the book, it was, what else? Had to be Mama Five and, and Represents for her son. So here I am. Okay, I want to start off this reading with a poem honoring my mother. My mother was the one who introduced me to poetry when I was a baby. She read poems to me at bedtime and she had a real love for poetry. She didn't write her own, but she memorized and recited long poems. And um, she loved Tennyson and Langston Hughes. So this is called For the Love of Tennyson and Langston. Bless my mother, her slingshot of poems and her tears as we prayed every night beside our little bed. Bless my mother and her red mist of words. Bless my mother's hand and her unmarried ring finger. Bless her scraps of favorite poems hidden in cardboards, in cupboards. Bless her haiku and vowels, her light melodious noise filling our house. Bless her narratives and her odes. Bless her Lord Tennyson and the poems she recited until the day she died. Bless her favorite poem, Charge of the Light Brigade. Bless her flip phone and her nurse's cap. Her excitement at college graduation at 50. 
bless my mother and the way she never spoke a bad word about my father. Lord knows she really had so much to tell. Bless her light kiss and her narrow kind eyes. Bless her wide green skirt and her delicate feet made for dancing. Her garnet lips and her bell of a voice. Her hands making straw hats, whispering and her laughter. Bless her laying on of poems and her fixing of shattered dreams. Bless my mother and her braid around her head. Bless her lean copper frame and the twins it bore. Bless her steady breath to my cheek, her neck with its long banjo song, her voice blessing wounds into poems. Bless my beautiful mother and the $7 she left into that note. Dear Cheryl, please take a cab to church. Jesus loves you, so does mommy. As I said, my mother was the impetus for my love of poetry. In the book, I go back and forth between reality, dreams, memories, and sometimes I write poems that look into the future. So this is one called One Sweet Braid Down Shabak. And I wrote this at the end of April 3030 as it was ending. I write with a group called Elma's Heart Circle that I named after my mother. We have an online gathering where we write um, something like a hundred poems each year. So this was at the end of April 3031 year. I want 30 more years of poems. I want tiger lily poems, orange blossom poems, and poems by Lucille Clifton and Suhir Hamad. Poems by Dion Brand and Joy Hardo. I want Grace Jones to sing she bumper songs, sweet and lawless. Don't care a damn what nobody feel. I want Jamaican yard poems. How I love that Nani of the Maroon talk. Give me some Trini Bush poems, spike with VAT 19 rum and plenty blue hundred dollar bills, lots and lots and lots of blue bills. So mommy could stay home and brush your hair and conk bills. And make flying fish and dumpling and count more blue bills and make new babies with names like Tamarin and Flambeau, names like Righteous and Kneel and Pray, names like One Sweet Braid Down Shabak, names like Morning Star and Inhabited. I want to write poems to taunt the gods and almost get them vets. Poems to white, to light white candles for good luck. Poems that blow kerosene and inspire rage. Oil drums to make steel pan and rock melodies until my dead twin come walking and shaven into in Riyadh with Malik on his arm and say, all right, all right, Olya, I home again. What Olya want me to do? And we, we light a big yard fire, make pigtail soup and homemade Guinness stout ice cream. This time around, the girls go churn the ice and the boys go just pour the salt. We go sing for we dead. We go drink a little rum, rub a little on the children gum. We go brew Moby, Bach, and Sorrel. And at 77, Granny go collect fresh blood and child beer again. 
and Cheryl and mommy go get back the twins they lost. And that was a fantasy poem that I had for my mother. I had watched her work so hard for so many years and I wanted to write a fantasy poem of how eventually I take care of her in this fancy extravagant style. So I'm going to um, share a little bit from Mama Five Represents. And I wanted to say that um, the, the year that I believe Malik, Malik became Five Dog was when he was nine and 10. And he did, I generally, we generally sent him to the YMCA camp. And this particular year, he did not want to go. And he was like, I, I don't like those kids. They fight and they curse. And I really want to just stay home with my grandmother. So I was thinking, okay, that might work. He said, you know, we go shopping for fruit. We visit the sick. We go to Bible study. And I listened and I was like, yeah, a lot of righteous actions was written into this thing, but I knew a lot of it had to do with this play that he loved to do so much. So I said to him, yes, you can stay home with grandma, but what I want you to do is once each day, I want you to stop and write me a poem or a letter or something. And this is how I want you to spend the summer. So just tell me what you're doing. It will make you a better writer later. I knew he was he had a love for poetry. So one of the first things he wrote was, Dear Mom, I wrote 15 great songs today. I don't know if he ever wrote 15 great songs that during that time. He was 10 years old, 1981. But I know that I believe that his love for writing and poetry and rap began that year. Also at that time, there was Run DMC, LL Cool J. So hip hop invaded our home. And from that point on, he was very much into it. So I, I, there's a second poem that he wrote well, there are quite a few, but I'm just going to read this, this other one that tickles me every time. He wrote a, a poem to the adults in the community, and it's called A Piece of My Mind. Now, here he was nine years old, writing to the community. Hey, people, I hate to say this, but younger brothers around here, hanging out on the mailbox, on the corners, and writing graffiti on the mailbox. They cut school and play Pac-Man, Galaxian, Donkey Kong, and they never stop. People, parents, you ought to give them a piece of your mind because when they get old, they will show, no, I should have studied. So people, Give them a piece of your mind. He was always teaching, I guess I would say. Ended up teaching with his music. This piece is called A Kiss. And I wrote this poem after uh, two weeks before his death, he was still traveling and touring and in the studio. And I met him in New Jersey at the ferry terminal. I would travel to wherever he was and spend the day with him or go into the studio with him. And this particular day, I went to see him. And so this piece is called Kiss. I want to kiss my child again and again. The New Jersey ferry terminal where I last held his hand and memorized every holy road in the country of his beautiful face. I want to kiss my child again and again. At 19, his fish body sliced through the warm embroidery of my bloodline. 
I held my baby, the first one to touch his face. I was never alone. For years I wore baby on my hip, held a baby to my lips. I was never alone. That child with a shimmering Afro, oh, the secrets birth thighs keep and damn the lessons hearts yield. I can't hold you now. I am alone, but never really alone. In the quiet of this night, I'm missing you. The way a weight makes one out of breath. Sometimes I feel like the child left. This is another piece, uh, one of the little anecdotes. I have a lot of anecdotes in the book about Malik. One of my fondest times with him was when he was a little boy. Of course, as he grew up, he, he still made me very happy. But something about that time was so magical. Part of it was that I was 20 and 21 raising a baby who we thought was very funny and bright. So this is a poem that he, this is a poem that he wrote. Well, no, it's, a, it's an incident that happened and I wrote about it later. It's called Pray. He was also very religious going to church with his grandmother. He stood near my bed, one hand jammed in his pocket, his thinking cap on slightly crooked. He surveyed my face. Then the delightful boy of seven said, mommy, do you pray? Yes, Malik, I responded. Mommy, he said more sternly, what words do you say? All the parents come to church except you two. I don't want to go to heaven and my parents are lost. I'm almost ready to be baptized, you know. I looked at my little Christian boy and did not have the heart to tell him, we don't go to church on Saturdays, babe. We stay home to watch Soul Train. He was very disapproving, but later on we found out that he was also staying home to watch Soul Train. So it was catching, definitely. How am I doing on time? You're good, Cheryl. Okay. People's instinctive travels and the paths of rhythm. This was the first tribe album. It was the end of eighth grade. That fall, our son would be going to boarding school. It was the most painful year for the three of us. After almost 18 years of marriage, his father and I were divorcing. Our son was hurting. That Christmas, he let me know in his very angry voice that he was never getting married. He said that he hated the way we had conducted the last few years of our marriage. What does a parent say? He was particularly displeased with me because he believed like his dad that I had ruined our marriage. The next few years for him were very tough. He seemed aimless and lost. Then he found hip hop. So when on that sunny October day, he told me he was leaving high school to go on tour with the Tribe Called Quest, I was overjoyed, but scared and sad. I was thrilled that he had found his sweet spot. Joy and excitement had returned to his spirit. I didn't dare say no. I watched my teenage son pack his bags and head to Europe. His very own people is instinctive travels and the past of rhythm. I'm going to read one or two sections that I called notes from the road. 
And so as he went on on his journey, he wrote, Mom, I'm moving to Atlanta. I'm sick of being the only child, the only grandchild, and the only nephew. You'll smother me to death, but I got to live. Mom, I'm going on tour with the Tribe Called Quest. We are going to Europe. Here's Malik once in Europe calling from London. Family, I'm headed home tomorrow. I'm off this tour. These folks won't give me a chance to showcase. They want me to do backup for Q-tip. This ain't no Diana Ross and the Supremes thing. I am backing up nobody. I'm here to kick my rhymes and show my skills. Mom, I met a girl, Disha. She reminds me of you. She has African paintings in her house, just like you, Mom. She has natural hair, no long extensions, no natural hair. She loves sports and hip hop. She's hella sweet. I think she's the one. Disha comes home to New York City. She's from California to meet us. Malik brings Disha home to meet grandma. Grandma is the apple of his eye. He wants her approval first. When I meet her, they are talking basketball and football. She's a Raiders fan. He's West Coast sweet, loves East Coast hip hop. I pay attention to the way they hold hands. She brings him tea with one equal, one splendor. At Thanksgiving that year, our whole family gathers at Malik's house. We are a loud and rowdy bunch. We meet Disha's son, David, for the first time. He's two years old and frightened by the noise. Hides his face in Malik's chest. He holds him close. We see for the first time he's a dad. We fall in love with that little boy. So uh, do I still have time? Well, let's um, ask a few questions. I'm hoping um, what I ask you will be things on other people's minds. And, okay. and then there may be time to conclude with one final poem. Um, I have a particular favorite that I would like you to read. So I'll leave a little space for that. Okay, which one is that? Um, it is called... Uh, Oh, well, I have two. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, well, when her child dies, actually, I want to ask you a bit about that poem. And okay. It's, okay. It's a sad one, but it's um, so uh, it's such a signature poem of the collection that you open with. And um, I wanted to just reflect to our guests tonight that um, there were two quotes about the book that I just wanted to recite here because they capture exactly how I responded to this volume. Um, it, it achieves so much. It's only 66 pages. And in those 66 pages, there's, there's a world contained, um, both this sort of microscope on the intimate life and yet also the entire context of the world and the cultures that come into it. So it's just an extraordinary um, book. So uh, thank, <laughs> thank you. you for writing it. Um, thank you. So Marty McConnell says, these poems shred and rebuild. They keen and holler. They are not ashamed. And that's exactly how I experienced the poems. They were just, just absolutely stunning and moving. And every time I go back to a particular poem, I get another wave of emotion 
from from the work. And then Anna Anna Marie Marine Lara said called the book a living archive, and I thought that is just so perfect because I was experiencing the book as an archive. And I think in the case of your son, who was such a public figure and represented, you know, people can inscribe on him, all, they can project all kinds of things as we do with popular prominent figures in the world, but the, the personal and the intimate and the vulnerability that you bring in really creates this living archive. And I also like the word living because there's a sense of a future here as well. You give us a path where we know that as, as tragic as his death was, we also understand that there's living to be done and you help yes. us, you help, you teach us that. So um, I just wanted to say, your readers are great. They really put into words the emotions that we readers get when we explore your book. I did want to ask you about, um, if I may, one poem that is so powerful when her child dies. And it struck me about your choice of the third person for this, when her child dies. And I'm wondering if the way I experienced it is how you wrote it or what your intentions were. But I felt that here is a woman, a mother who's splintered off from everything familiar and from herself. You have a line, she will come to distrust her universe. And that therefore it couldn't be the contained identity, the I. And also the universality of motherhood and mother's grief. Yes. And I'm wondering if that is partly your intention by choosing to write the poem in the third person. It was my intention. And it was one of the earliest poems that I wrote. And honestly, after Malik passed away, I did not know who I was anymore. I could not, if I pinched myself, I couldn't even feel it. This is how numb I got. And I felt like that was the only way I could write that poem because everything was outside of me. The only thing inside was grief and sorrow and intense loss. And I didn't know how else to write that poem. So I just wrote it about somebody else because that's how I was feeling. This is not my life, but this is somebody else's life. Because, you know, I had two lives with my son. I had the life when he was Malik and I had the life when he was five dog and my God, was that life extravagant. <laughs> you know, traveling everywhere, meeting Mary J. Blige and Beyonce and this, you know, so really, really was so. And then I was caught in the middle of those two things and so much else, you know, cause Malik had a twin brother when he was born and he only lived for eight hours. So there was a lot of sorrow that I had held back for years to function and support Malik and myself, my writing. And um, I was outside of my body then, honestly. Right. And I experienced it that way as well. It was almost like there's this glass wall and um, it, it's just an extraordinary poem. I've read it several times and I'm just, I'm shaken by it. Um, oh, thank you. I also wanted to actually ask you about um, Malik's lost twin, because in the book, you talk about how early on, when Malik was Malik, he would actually behave as if his, he had his brother, his friend, he would write to him or write songs. Mm -hmm. And then as Fife Dog actually composed some lyrics as well. And I'm wondering if this perception resonates with you that there was a, an original loss that happened that he internalized that was deep and wounding, but also something that compelled him to seek out meaning and joy and creativity that life is precious. I'm wondering if there was something that early on that really uh, just inflected his journey? Well, I know that when I was born, 
I had a twin brother that was stillborn. And so my mom never told me anything about it. I found out when I was 16 years old, because when I was 14 and 15, I was going around saying, well, I'm going to have twins when I get married and I'm going to call them this and this. And my mother's sister said to me one day, you know, you probably are going to have twins because you're a twin. So I was so shocked. I was 16. But I also felt cheated that my mother had not shared that with me. So Walt and I, Malik's dad and I decided that we weren't going to keep anything away from him, that he had a twin brother who passed away. So we always spoke about Michael in the house. His name was Michael. We always spoke about him. And so there were times Malik wrote little poems or he would tell me, oh, Michael visited me, you know, in, in the morning when he would wake up and he said such and such, you know. Um, I'm, I believe in spirit and spirit visiting, yeah. so it was not an odd thing for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I love that that you brought him up with those understandings. And um, we, when you and I were chatting briefly before um, the program started, we, we recognized that we were born just a year apart and we're basically in the same generation. And I recognized so well the ethos that you and Walter had, which was like, our kid's going to have this and our kids oh, going to yeah. have that and yeah. we're not going to have be strict parents and all yes, of that yes. um, and so it's really interesting when we go on the journey with you in the book to find the times where Malik has his own issues with the parenting that you do as hard as you tried to be the perfect yeah. parents yeah. Um, and there's that texture there there's another um I call it a poem, but I think it might be a dream sequence because it's italicized. And I don't know if that's an indication to us that- um, Yes, dream sequence. Okay. Um, and I'm just so blown away by the images in this that seem planetary and ancient. And I'm wondering if the actual images came to you in a dream because they're, they, they seem otherworldly and deep. Um, it's in that little section that starts orchids grow lush. And um, it's, and the, the lines that just amaze me, he came a small wiry flame and then Mouth a red city, hands dark as the Volta River. Yeah. I just can't get all, I, where do these words come from, Cheryl? They're, <laughs> <laughs> they seem like they, they're, they're just, the, the human brain could not have made those. They must have, you must have conjured them somehow. Yeah, well, I think when it, for that poem in particular, I had gone to Ghana when um, Malik was about a year old. And there were so many things that I saw there. They referred to me as a present ancestor. And so there were so many things that I just held on to or just held on to me. I'm not sure which it was, but those things, you know, the, the river, well, the, the outdoor, the river, the tree, the earth, has always meant so much to me because that is what I grew up with in Trinidad. All the flowers that are in my work, the soil. And you know, that was a way for me to hold on to the life that I had for the first 13 years of my life in Trinidad. And so I recall things, rocks and trees and tree box, things like that, that show up in my poems and I'm never afraid of them. I just no. go with it and I don't, I don't try to make sure that the reader will understand or no. not. It's just yeah. in my heart and in my well, you had, body. You had the choice of one plant that um, sent me to the dictionary. And I like that because I like a poem that asks me to learn something. I want to know why you're using this particular plant and why you would associate it with something yellow that is bitter. I mean, these are things that resonate. You know, the poem isn't just for celebrating, it's also for teaching, I think. And yes, I appreciate yes. that. I, um, we have a little bit of time and uh, I hope I'm not being too 
invasive to ask this question and let me know if it's not one you care to answer, but absolutely. Just knowing that writing is something you must do. This is who you are. I mean, it's just how you filter the world in some ways is this, the writing process, but also knowing, you know, how uh, grief was so massive. And yet you produced this book. And I'm wondering if along the way you were able to write into your grief without thinking of it as a book or a project, but just something that you were able to do to try to find a way through. Yes, absolutely. When I began writing, there was no idea of a book in my head. But what had happened was I began losing things. I began forgetting everything. Like I'd lose my keys, I'd lose my pocketbook. You know, just, and one day I said to my partner, I said, was my brother at the funeral? And she looked at me and she said, yes. So I was losing my memory. And I, and I felt that by the end of that year, I would no longer have Malik in my life or close to me. It's, it's just an odd, crazy grief thing, which, and grief comes to people in different ways. But I knew that the thing that has always sustained me has been my writing. And I knew I had to start writing these down. So it really started as journal entry. And I began writing so I would not forget what his voice sounded like, what, the conversations were between us, especially those childhood conversations too. So, and then once I decided that, once I saw that it was a book, I knew that I would put in dreams and yeah. some conversations I had with him, even the hard things. This was a way for my survival. I guess the, it's always hard to mourn, but public mourning, ah, Boy, that, that's very hard. I have to say that the universe blessed us because people just came out and showered us with love. Showered us with love and the way they loved Malik and his music. And that was really helpful to us, really helpful and supportive. Um, in, in, very, in a very concise um, way, you capture all these nuances in the book, the experience of you, Cheryl, in the world, among other people's ways of grieving in the public mourning. There's a section where with your daughter-in-law, you're having, there's an exchange about the media and an expectation that there's some public facing expression, which must have felt so disconnected from your interior life at that point. And all of this is contained in the book. I'm wondering if you can say anything um, to our listeners tonight about joy. <laughs> ah, yeah, well, I've always been a joyous woman. And when I lost Malik, I did not think that I could be that again. I couldn't be joyous. I couldn't do anything to help other people. But I've learned once I, I writing this book gave me back my joy, but it's been five years. So it's taken a while. But as I said, the, my daughter-in-law and I, my daughter-in-law would call me every morning. She lives in California. She'd call me at 5 a.m. because she wasn't sleeping and I wasn't sleeping. So we would just talk and talk about him and talk about how we felt. And we, we did that for, the better part of two years. And so we were helping each other, healing each other. And my friends, my beautiful poet friends, they were always there to come and do a laying off on laying on of hands. And it has brought joy back into my life. When the book first came out in January and February, I was doing interviews. It was on Zoom. I didn't know how totally healed I was. But when it was on Zoom, so I could look back at that, and I heard myself laughing and joking and having a good time, and I knew I was back. <laughs> it makes me want to cry, actually. I knew I was back, and that happened 
because I opened my heart, you know, and before the book came out, I was embarrassed that I had shared so much and, but, you know, I had to talk to, to my daughter-in-law and I had to talk to my ex-husband, let them know what I was writing because Malik didn't only belong to me. Yes, and exactly. To, I'm yeah. glad you brought that up because that's always a question that writers have is, what belongs to me? What do I have a right to say? Yes. And it yes. seemed to me your book was extraordinarily sensitive in that way. And I also want to say, Cheryl, that I'm certain that your book is giving courage to, yes. to especially women and mothers, but to anyone who's experienced a deep loss. It, it really helped me with a loss that I've experienced in my life a, a big loss that I've not ever through processing and um uh -huh. even the yes. even the epigraph you use from Rumi it was was sort of um consoling to me so the the whole thing your honesty your even expressing your anger in the poetry and every you know it all was so authentic and generous and so um, I'm sure I am among many who are thanking you for this book. I appreciate that. I, I'm so glad that it can help somebody. And yes. Lord knows it has helped me to. And I also wanted to, to document this for my grandson, who's now 25. Oh, wow. Yeah, yes, Dave, I David. Wanted, David yeah. yeah, I wanted to document this for him so he'll always have it. Absolutely. Um, I know we're a little over time, but I'm going to um, push on our time and ask you to please read the opening poem, which is, okay. um, it's a tough one, but it's amazing. Yeah, when, when the child, child dies. dies. And what I like to is the closing one, which shows what I've gained, yeah. you know, because the first one was really like, I have nothing. Okay, when her child dies for Malik. When her child dies, a mother does not know her heart will leap out of her chest. With such force, it would cause a rebellion. She does not know that her hands will be numb for weeks. She does not know her sugar will rise, even though she has not eaten in two days. She will come to distrust her universe. Her black-eyed Susans, her sweet William, the soil she loves to squish her toes in. Sun hugging her aching shoulders, moon scurrying across her worn windowsill. She will mistrust them all. When her child dies, friends will come daily with milk, honey, cheese, red wine, spelt bread and ginger jam. She will not remember their touch, only their eyes glossed over with tears. She does not know she will stop speaking to his father and threaten to sue him. Her hair will fall out in clumps. She will lose big spaces of memory. When her child dies, a woman will fight for her sanity. She will travel to Anguilla, beg Yamaya to bring him back. As the ocean swells, she will listen for his laughter. She will press her face in the damp earth, call his name, Malik, Malik, Malik Isaac. Thank you, Cheryl, for reading that. And thank you for the gift of sharing your writing, your voice, and your self with us tonight. I know Dan is going to come on now and close. And I just want to say how grateful we are, not just for this book, but for you in the world. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, thank you. I feel the same way about you. You know, we have, my middle name is Allison, so I've always... <laughs> Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, You're welcome. Thank, you. thank you, Allison, for, for uh, your insightful questions. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, our, our funders. 
uh, bring those up here. Uh, by the book, the link is in the chat. Um, a video of this reading and uh, as well as our previous readings are, will be online on our website, wab.org. You can also uh, see our upcoming uh, readings uh, coming up. Uh, and I wanna say thank you to everyone